Beautiful. And good morning, everyone. It is good to be together to worship this morning. I am so grateful that the snow cooperated and uh, came, uh, came a day early, and I'm also grateful for the person who plows our parking lot. They do such a good job. Uh, it is good to be together to worship on this second Sunday of Lent. Today we are also celebrating Holy Communion, and so if you're joining with us online, you might want to pause the service and gather some bread and wine or juice so you can take part in the sacrament when that time comes in the service. Here at St. Mark's we are gathering on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, specifically Ojibwe and Chippewa peoples. This land is covered by Lake Simcoe Treaty 16 and the J. Collins Land Purchase. The reason we acknowledge this land every day is I think it's so important to be reminded that we, we all need to learn to live together uh, on this land, on this traditional territory, with respect for this land and also for the people who were here for generations and actually thousands of years before uh, our ancestors came. So that is my hope that we will all learn uh, to do that well. There are some special days to celebrate within our congregation this week. Uh, it's Allison Skinner's birthday on Wednesday, and she will be enjoying that in the beautiful warmth of Florida. They left last week. It's Lori Windrum's birthday on Thursday. Larry, it's Lori Windrum's birthday on Thursday. <laughs> And it is Wayne Savage's birthday on Friday. So let's sing to them all. I was uh, neglectful last week. I had it written in my notes and I forgot to say it, but I want to publicly acknowledge my gratitude to Lori Metcalf for the beautiful Lenten decorations. Aren't they lovely? <laughs> so thank you, Lori, for, for that and for all it adds to our worship because it really does make a difference. Um, I also want to let you know that this morning when I arrived at church, I received a beautiful gift from Ray Corey. It's a, it's a little stone that is going to go in my uh, devotion spot at home, and it says, God surrounds us by his grace. And I think that's a wonderful message for us all to remember, particularly at Lent, but ev every single day of our lives. So thank you to Ray for that, and I hope you will all remember that each day during Lent as well. Uh, this week, there are several uh, activities on the go. It's Knit One, Pray Two, Tuesday morning. It is Games Night, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. Everyone is welcome to come. There are all sorts of games, some that uh, are new and some that are old. And there, uh, in our first one last month, there was so much laughter and just joy at being together. So uh, I hope you can come if that night is free for you. Uh, on Wednesday morning, we are having the women's breakfast out at Barnfield Point, the curling club, um, and uh, any women in the congregation are very welcome to come, and that's at 9 o'clock in the morning. If you have an issue with transportation, please let me know or your elder know, and we'll figure that out. And, of course, we have choir practice on Thursday morning. And if you feel so moved by the Spirit to sing, then you just come along to choir practice. If you have any questions, you can talk to Terry after the service. Uh, next week, I, I actually remembered this on my own this time. Usually, Irene's reminding me. Um, next week, we spring forward in our time, in our clock. So I know it always catches me by surprise, but if you forget to do that, you're going to come in as we're singing the benediction, <laughs> or saying the benediction. So um, next week, turn your clock ahead, and uh, we, we lose an hour, but uh, that does is a sign that spring is, is a little bit closer to coming. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge that this week, uh, at the beginning of every month, we're, we're getting a little update like this, and Lori Metcalf is pr providing that for us. So if you haven't received one, pick it up on your way out. It just tells you about upcoming events, and it also gives you a financial update on where we are as a church, because I think that's always good information for everyone to have. Um, 
the first item on that is that uh, reminder that uh, we once again are just reminding people that masks are optional. I know some people have a hard time wearing them and breathing through them. Other people need to wear them and they do remain the very best uh, thing to prevent passing of any kind of illness. So uh, we respect everyone's individual decision about whether they are masking or not. Um, and uh, we just wanted to reiterate that if you find it difficult to wear one, it is no longer mandatory. I don't think there are any other uh, announcements. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Lori has an announcement. Please come forward. <laughs> sorry, Lori. Good morning, everyone. I just want to remind you that ne um, next Friday morning, the 17th, um, is our St. Patrick's Day luncheon, uh, sittings at uh, 11.30 and 1 o'clock. Uh, we have tickets um, available here today. Um, and um, just a reminder to those of you who are have volunteered to bring um, veggies for the stew, um, those things can be brought in any time because we can just keep them in the cold the cold room. Um, the salad fixings and stuff, that's something that's going to be uh, picked up the day before um, the, the luncheon. But as I say, the stew fixings can be brought in any time. Um, we're here Tuesday morning for Knit One, Pray Two, or you can bring them next Sunday. That would be great. Um, so Mary has tickets today um, and a few more posters, I think, too. Um, if you're able to put a poster up somewhere for us, that would be great as well. Um, we're still looking for, yes, Mary? Okay, so they're at the bottom of the stairs on our, um, our, our beautiful table. Um, the, um, we're also looking for some silent auction items. It doesn't have to be a new item or uh, gently used treasures that you've had. Um, this seems to be a, a really good uh, um, addition to our luncheons. Um, and the, the proceeds from the silent auction will be going towards our, um, our Operation Cool Down, our, our HEPA um, uh, project. So um, I still need um, a few people, if anybody's able to help serve or um, come for cleanup, that would be good. Um, and I think that's it for the luncheon. Any questions? No? Okay, thank you. And now I think it's time for our good news segment for this week. And I'm going to invite Lori Metcalf forward. I'm the other Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Linda called us L's Angels. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Um, so for good news this week, we're going to share with you a, a great opportunity we have as a church. It is um, Lent, and we've been talking a lot about sharing our love. And we can share our love in so many different ways um, by reaching out to others. But our, our members of session have tried to come up with ways that we can share our love with perhaps the homeless or perhaps people who are living in really vulnerable situations, living with abuse or living with day-to-day um, -day not having enough money to pay rent, that kind of thing. So we, we've decided to partner up with a, a really neat little organization here in Aurelia for the next uh, month, and perhaps continually, we'll see. Um, it's called Uplifting Blessings. And if any of you have heard of it, um, it was started by a young woman from Aurelia who suffered a terrible abuse and uh, had to escape from a, a partner and escape with her children. And she, wa she did a lot of healing and tried to figure out how she could help others who'd been through what she'd been through. And so she started this organization. It's a registered charity called Uplifting Blessings. They have a, a space on West Street at Northern Roots Hair Salon on the um, lower level. And they gather items for all kinds of families, single adults, children, 
who perhaps are escaping from a, a difficult living situation or perhaps have just ended up not being able to pay the rent and are out. Um, so what we thought for the next month, we have an opportunity to maybe collect some new items for some of those folks who really need help. And so I'm going to put a love box down here at the front starting next Sunday. And we're going to gather um, pajamas for kids. So if you could buy uh, a set of kids' pajamas, that would be great. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, we're also going to collect track pants, or what do they call them? Joggers, OK. <laughs> the comfy pants um, for men and women. So any of those three items, kids' pajamas, comfy pants, for men or for women, um, and of course, kids' pajamas for boys or girls, any size, there's no limit. And we're going to try to fill up our love box, and by Palm Sunday, we'll deliver it to Uplifting Blessings, so that they have a new supply that they can give out when the need arises. And we thought this was a really practical way we could share our love with the community around us. So I hope you'll take this opportunity to be part of this. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. That is perfect. And of course, uh, I, I always, you know, when I had little people, when spring came, it was always nice to be able to give them, you know, new fresh jammies that for a new season. So I think this is just a, a perfect opportunity to do that. So thank you, Lori. And thank you, everyone, in advance. Oftentimes we believe that we must deserve the love we receive. We work and work and work to get approval and to feel like our life is justified, pulling our own weight, thinking that whatever life we create and love we get is only what we ourselves can conjure up. But the scriptures today offer the image of God as our keeper, always helping, always present, always willing to pay attention to what it is that we need. It's not all up to simply doing the right thing. It's about allowing the Spirit to help birth love in our lives. So I would invite you to join in singing. Let us join together in opening our hearts to the love of God. Before we even utter a word, we can be assured that God will offer to us grace and a way forward. 
For this reason, we can be honest with God about what pains us most about our own thoughts and actions. Let us pray. Holy and merciful one, in this season of discernment, we come bringing our deepest longings and our failed attempts at satisfying them. We have often looked for love, for acceptance and security in formulas that we believe will assure success at the expense of staying tuned to the Spirit's nudge. We yearn for lives that matter. We desire relationships that thrive. We want less regret. At times we fail to see that you have already given us what really matters, your love and acceptance. You provide opportunities all around us to make a difference in the lives of others. You give us a fresh start each day, inviting us to do better. In this time of silence, we bring before you our pleas for openness to a different way of living. My friends, be assured by the psalmist who says, the Lord will keep your life, your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Let us respond together. We open our hearts, our minds, our souls, our vision to the ways of love created by God, embodied in Jesus, and already moving in us by the Spirit, we are forgiven, loved, and freed. Amen. I would invite you to join in singing our opening hymn, Jesus' Hands Were Kind Hands, which is number 631 in our book of praise. Today, as I was thinking about what I could say for a word for all ages, I was thinking of our scripture lesson, our gospel lesson for today, which takes place in a place that uh, we visited on our trip to Israel. It was about a time that Jesus was very, very busy, and he was interrupted. He was walking along a street, and suddenly there was an interruption in his day. You need to interrupt me? Yes. Oh, okay, no problem. No problem. What what do you need to interrupt me I for? I forgot to tell people about the Easter eggs. Oh, oh yeah, that's important. So you go you go ahead. You go ahead. Good morning again. <laughs> so sorry to interrupt, but I forgot to mention about the Easter eggs. We have plenty of of the um, Eagle brand milk, but we still need lots of icing sugar. So if you if you are out shopping and you can pick up some icing sugar, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
That's okay. I don't mind being interrupted for important things like that, Lori. Thank you very much. So as I was saying before I was interrupted, <laughs> Jesus was walking along a street. He was surrounded by people, and he was interrupted by a woman in need of healing. And as we will hear, this story about, uh, about Jesus is both good news for us, it's also a bit of a challenge for us. The good news is that when, when Jesus was interrupted by a sick woman, he didn't get upset because he knew whatever she was about to say was, and what stopped her was, was important. And I think we sometimes need to be reminded that Jesus is always willing to hear from us whenever we need him. We don't need to worry that we're not praying at a certain time that we might be interrupting Jesus in something else that Jesus is busy with. But the challenge is that as Jesus' disciples, we are also called to be like Jesus. And that means that we are called to be uh, willing to be interrupted too. And I know sometimes being interrupted can be challenging. And that was a setup, by the way. You all know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But we are reminded that we need to be willing to pay attention to the needs of others as they arise, not just when it's convenient for us, but when others need help, we are called to be like Jesus, the one we follow, and do what needs doing when the, when the need arises. So um, that is our little takeaway for our, our word for all ages today. I would invite you to join now in singing uh, our song of preparation, which is Love Us Into Fullness, as we uh, prepare to hear the word of God in scripture and song. first reading today is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. Listen now for the Gospel of our Lord. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. 
Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. was the perfect choice for today. Thank you. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, anyone who has had or has taken care of wee babies or little people will undoubtedly agree that they seem to have an uncanny ability to notice when someone leaves their room when they're supposed to be asleep, when you think they're sleeping soundly. I experienced this with both of my daughters who could be sleeping what I thought sleeping deeply one moment, and then the next when I just took one little step toward the door of the room, they would suddenly be fully and widely awake and demanding my attention. And it doesn't only happen when they're really little, because this weekend I was down to see my, uh, my grandkids in London. William just turned seven. And I, I had a delightful time reading to him before bed one night. And then we talked, and I was rubbing his back and singing to him. And I would have been absolutely certain he was deeply asleep. And I got up very quietly. And the minute I put my foot on the floor, which squeaked, <laughs> he said... Grandma, where are you going? <laughs> so I went and lay down again. And <laughs> this uh, seemingly special skill of theirs reminded me of uh, today's gospel lesson in the way that something so very subtle can be noticed and can also be really important. Today we're continuing uh, with our series of Women on the Way, Encounters with Jesus. During the weeks leading up to Good Friday and Easter, we will explore the stories of some women whose lives were changed by Jesus and whose faith and commitment and trust in God had an impact 
on Jesus on his way to the cross. Our scripture reading told of a time when Jesus had returned from the other side of the Sea of Galilee and a huge crowd had been following him because his deeds of healing and, and uh, uh, mir- different miracles that he had done, word had been spreading throughout that region of the world. So there were a lot of people who were always gathered around Jesus whenever he was out in public. I want you to imagine a narrow roadway thick with people and the crowd moving almost as one as they walked down it. It would have been easy to get swept up in a crowd in such a situation. And in the midst of that tight crowd, a desperate woman had fought her way through all the people to reach out, to be close enough to reach out and touch Jesus' cloak. The woman had a chronic illness that had led her to be bleeding for 12 years. 12 years is a long time. That's as long as I've been a minister here. That's a long time. In a culture that had clearly defined boundaries between what was ritually clean and ritually unclean, her illness would have caused her to be seen as unclean and so to be considered to be an outcast. She was ignored and she was virtually unseen by everyone. She was, in that culture, someone you would not want to be bumping up against in a crowd. And so in desperation, the woman did what she had to do to get to Jesus, this healer that she had heard so much about. I imagine she figured that at that point in her life, what would she have to lose? She'd already done and given everything she had. She'd spent all her money, all her resources to find an impossible cure. She was out of options. She was past the edge of hopelessness. So why not risk it all by pushing her way through the crowd to get near Jesus? Perhaps, maybe, she thought if she could just touch his robe, she would be made well. She took a chance, and she reached out her hand to touch the robe of Jesus, and and in what I would describe as a pretty underwhelming way, the woman was healed. Now, I think that we, we can often imagine miraculous healings happening in a very dramatic way, and in fact, some of Jesus' healings were very dramatic. We've heard of faith healers in some church traditions who shout while apparently healing uh, people who fall to the ground and then people look on with awe and wonder and in prayer and praise. But those thousands of years ago when Jesus healed this woman, it was in a more muted and less obvious way as the power that came from God flowed through him to bring new life to her. Jesus merely needed the touch of a hand or sometimes simple instructions to stand up and walk, and healing happened. It was in that understated and subtle way that the unseen outcast woman was made well, and Jesus knew it. Even with the crowd so close and other people undoubtedly reaching out to touch him as well, Jesus realized that someone had touched him and someone had been healed. So he stopped, and he asked who it was. In some fear, the woman fell down at his feet and admitted that it was her, and scripture tells us she told him the whole truth. Reminds me of that line, the whole truth and nothing but the truth a statement from every courtroom drama on television. There at the feet of Jesus, I wonder, even with the crowd around, did she tell the whole truth? Did she say how she had suffered terribly, how she had been outcast from her community? Did she share that she had given all she owned just to find a way to be made well? Did she describe her hope in Jesus as the one she believed could heal her? Whatever the conversation was, Jesus said to the woman, Daughter, your faith has made you well. 
He didn't say woman. He said daughter. Just like a child so loved by a parent. And Jesus didn't ask anything of her, but he only praised her faith and he wished her peace. At the feet of Jesus, in faith and in love, the woman was healed and restored to wholeness, now feeling like a worthy and valued child of God. I'm going to share with you some photos now of my visit to the Holy Land last year. We visited uh, the ancient city of Magdala, which is an archaeological site. That is um, the sign describing the synagogue there. And we could go to the next picture now. This is the synagogue of Magdala. Um, you will see the um, uh, stone table in the middle. That is where the scrolls would have been unrolled and they would have been read uh, through uh, the synagogue service there. But what I really wanted you to notice is the stone benches all the way around. It's in a square all the way around. Uh, you can go on to the, the next one. Uh, I, this is the uh, main building um, just uh, closer to the Sea of Galilee from that archaeological site. Uh, you can see the Sea of Galilee in the background. Um, that's okay. Uh, this, uh, this is the atrium of that building. It is very, very beautiful. You can see the fish on the ceiling, uh, of course, representing the fish in the Sea of Galilee. Um, but this building is open, uh, uh, open to uh, Christians of all backgrounds and denominations. It honors women of the Bible and women, uh, all f women of all faith. Um, this is the atrium of that, uh, of that building, and um, there are eight pillars that are around that. Um, you know, if you can just go back to that first one, um, that, is, that is, was one of the pillars. Um, uh, the middle of the atrium is that large font that you can see there, and women are invited to dip their fingers in, um, in that water. There is one of the pillars, and you can show the one, there's one for Mary Magdalene, there's one, seven of them have women of the Bible's names on them, and there's one that doesn't have any names on them, um, so that the women who come in can dip their finger in that water and write their own names on that pillar, acknowledging that they are part of the women of faith. Okay, we can go on to the next one. That is the main, uh, uh, the main um, chapel of, of that building. You can see there is a boat there. It is a life-size boat. And it really, as you look past it, that is the Sea of Galilee. So it's really very, very spectacular to, uh, to see that. Um, it commemorates Jesus preaching from the water. Remember the story about Jesus going out in a boat and preaching from the water? Um, and there are also um, four chapels, each done in beautiful mosaics. Uh, this is Jesus telling the wind and the waves to calm down. We can go on to the next one. This is when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter. It says Talitha Kum, which means little girl, get up. And we can go on to the next one. That is the Mary Magdalene Chapel, where Mary meets Jesus uh, on the first Easter morning. And there might be one other, I'm not sure. No, there, I didn't get a picture of the last one. The last one is the Fishers of Men Chapel, which shows Jesus calling the disciples. But down a set of stairs, we, we went to the uh, what is called the Encounter Chapel, which is modeled after the structure of that first century synagogue that I showed you earlier. With um, uh, It features this beautiful mural size painting. Um, it's pro the painting is probably as big as the whole front of this church, and that's the altar table that sits in front of it. Around the sides are those stone benches made to replicate the early synagogue. We uh, had some time as a group in that chapel, and we we were able to sit on the stone benches. We heard uh, the story again of Jesus, of the women, the story we just heard this morning of the woman being healed. And we saw this image of uh, the woman's hand reaching toward the feet of Jesus um, and touching his cloak. It was really meaningful and very emotional for, for many of us. At the feet of Jesus, the woman was healed and loved and valued and given a chance of new life. So I wonder, what gives something value? 
what gives some one value. How many of you have ever seen the Antiques Roadshow on TV? It, was, it used to be more popular than it is right now, but if you have any interest in old stuff, then that is the show for you. I've watched it a few times, and I think it's, it's really neat to see all of the antiques and things that people have passed down from one generation to another over time. And the interesting thing is to learn what they were used for and why they were made, because some of them we would have no idea. But that's not the most exciting part of that show. Um, we get to see what those antiques are worth. And they always show a person whose great-grandfather or someone like that picked up an item at a flea market uh, hundreds of years ago and, and paid a dollar for it, and it's been sitting in someone's attic ever since. And the expert looks at the item, and they talk about where it was made and why it was made and what it was for, and then they, they ask the owner this big question, do you have any idea what this is worth? And the person says, oh, I don't know, really, maybe, maybe $50. And then the expert says, well, in an auction today, this item would probably bring between fifteen and $20,000 or more. And the owner then is speechless and stunned and amazed, and they probably go home and increase their insurance. <laughs> they never imagined that what they valued to be a piece of junk would be worth something. Suddenly things change for that item, but it's not that the object has changed, it's remained exactly the same. It's the value of the object to the owner that has changed, because now they know just how much other people think this item is worth. We know that as soon as they get home, this item is not just going to be put on a shelf, it's going to be displayed in a prominent place, and it's going to be kept safe all because they now know the value of that heirloom. So I wonder then how we would measure the value and the worth of another human being. What are the standards that we use to assign value to another life? If we go with the values of our culture, it would be all about how much money they had and power and perhaps how beautiful they are, the kind of influence they have in the world. But as Christians, we are called to assign different values to measure the worth of another person. And these are values that were modeled to us and taught to us by Jesus. Because Jesus found value where no one else did. In the marginalized, in the poor, in the doubters, in the sick, and the outcast, Jesus saw a person's worth. So what about us? Do we measure the value and worth of people? Do we measure a life just like our Lord and Savior Jesus did? The musical Rent was written in the early 90s. It's an edgy story that takes place in New York City, and it addresses issues of drug addiction and HIV AIDS and personal identity and ultimately the bonds of friendship. It has some excellent songs in it, and one of the more well-known ones is called Seasons of Love. The song begins with the words, 525,600 minutes. That's how many minutes there are in a year. And it goes on to say, 525,600 minutes, how do you measure? Measure a year. In daylights, in sunsets, in midnights, in cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter, in strife, in 525,600 minutes, how do you measure a year in the life? How about love? Measure in love. Measure a life in love. Measure a life in love. 
The measure of a Christian and really the measure of all human beings is how we treat each other with love in all circumstances, despite our differences and perhaps because of our differences. Bishop Michael Curry of the Episcopal Church in the United States became widely known after he preached at a certain royal wedding a few years back. And he says about the way we, the church, deal with the challenges of the world, if it doesn't look like love, if it doesn't look like Jesus of Nazareth, it cannot be claimed to be Christian. In other words, if it doesn't look like love, it isn't Christian. Our example of Christian love is Jesus, who finds all to be worthy. It is at the feet of Jesus and in the eyes of Jesus, in the love of Jesus, that we are all the same. The love of Jesus is the great equalizer, so that differences between people that we determine based on gender or status or language or sexual orientation or race or citizenship, even religion, all melt away at the feet of Jesus. Because at the feet of Jesus, there is not an us and them and some people and not those people. At the feet of Jesus, all people are loved people. At the feet of Jesus, our value and our worth is measured in love. And so we are called to see people for who they really are, unique persons, each created in the image of God, each worthy of our attention and our care and our love and our respect. That includes the woman who bled for 12 years, the disciple who doubted, the man who failed again, the woman who couldn't hold a job, the girl who dropped out of high school, the boy who got hooked on drugs, the family with no home. All of these are God's children and all are beloved by God. It was Jesus' acceptance and compassion and mercy that led Jesus to give the ultimate gift of love on the cross, dying so that we all might have life. You know, throughout his life, Jesus was constantly crossing boundaries of what was religiously or socially acceptable to see and love people for who they were, desperate for meaning, desperate to be fed, desperate to be healed, desperate enough to push their way through a crowd to reach out to be healed in faith at the feet of Jesus. May we each be like that woman, unafraid to ask for healing when we need it. May we also be like Jesus, unafraid to give value and worth and love to all we meet. Amen. In this season of Lent, we're joining together in prayer using an ancient form of prayer in the church. The Greek words Kyrie eleison mean God have mercy on us, and Christe eleison mean Christ have mercy on us. We learned a simple way to sing this last week, and we're going to be repeating this throughout Lent. We will be led in various intercessions, uh, prayers in different categories each week, and we will follow that by singing Kyrie in response to each one. I think the repetition of this beautiful song of Kyrie is itself a prayer, and I hope it can get into your mind and your heart throughout Lent so it can come to you at times when you need to ask for help from God, because God's mercy is a gift of love, that is given freely to all of us. So I would invite you to join in singing Kyrie eleison. (laughs) 
Let us pray. Loving Creator, we come to you asking for the strength of your help in this world. We struggle as we find so much to be chaotic and overwhelming. You set this world in motion and gave us the ability to co-create the future with you. We ask that you would help us to trust your presence in the midst of all we do not understand. Show us how to love, especially when all is not within our control. We pray this day for those mourning loss in the deadly train crash in Greece, in the long fraught and in the new waves of turmoil in the West Bank of Palestine, lands where you walked. We pray as we observe continued loss and political gridlock of the war in Ukraine. We pray that for all those who lost their lives and whose lives were upended in Turkey and Syria through the terrible earthquakes they've experienced. We pray for the girls poisoned in schools in Iran to prevent their further education. God, have mercy. In this singing, we lift up this world to you with our love. for the strength of your help in our communities. We do not see things from the same perspectives and it so often causes divisions among us. Show us how to love across these divides of how things ought to be. So many are ailing from circumstances of body, mind and spirit that are beyond their control. We pray in silence this day for all who are on our minds and hearts. God, have mercy. In this singing, we lift up this community to you with our love. Loving parent, we come to you asking for the strength of your help in our homes and relationships. Open us to feel the bond of your spirit between us and among us, especially when we're not sure how to help each other. We pause in silence as we each lift up in our hearts the relationships in our lives that need your love and transformation. God, have mercy. In this singing, we lift up each other to you with our love. Lover of our souls, we come to you asking for the strength of your help to love ourselves. Help us to break out of the prisons that we have made for ourselves, believing that we have to work our way into love and acceptance. Help us to really know deep down in our bones that it is your already present and ever-present love that is the bedrock of our lives that this love can be multiplied through us in this world, in our communities and in the lives with whom we intersect each day. God, have mercy. In this singing, we open ourselves to your love.
And so as your people following in the ways of your son, Jesus, who set the pattern of love in moving beyond control into the mystery of the spirit, we pray with confidence the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our lives are blessed with the goodness that comes from God. Let us trust that goodness to sustain us and so offer to God a portion of those gifts to share with the world and make hearts glad. The offering will now be received. Let us pray. Generous God, we offer our gifts to you in gratitude for all that we have received in Christ and in creation. Bless our gifts and our lives so that we can share in the building up of your kingdom in this world you love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, if love seems to elude, Come searching at this table, for here you will find a host that does not disappoint. The feast is laid for all who come looking for love and vow to spread that love around with others. All too often we have looked for love in all the wrong places. In this silence we open ourselves to a change in our paths, to seeing with new eyes, to setting aside empty promises. and see that God is love. In the name of Jesus Christ, know that your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this wonderful gift. Amen. You're invited to share the love and invitation of Christ by saying to your neighbors now, taste and see that God is love. You can just turn to the person next to you. Taste and see that God is love. I would invite you to join now in the prayers or the responses for the great prayer of thanksgiving. May love be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, love eternal, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we could not fathom your endless love and we turned away, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise the name of love and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Please join in singing the first verse of All Who Hunger. All who What love you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit poured out through him as he brought good news, proclaimed freedom, healed and fed. His life of love shows us the way. His life of love delivers us from false hopes. His life, death and resurrection offered ultimate and enduring love. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for love of you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of this love in Jesus Christ, we offer our love completely as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Please join in singing the second verse of Taste and See. your love and your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the love of Christ so that we may be for the world the love of Christ. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son Jesus Christ, With the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Please join in singing verse 3 of All Who Hunger.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would invite you now to partake in your bread and the fruit of the vine. Let us pray. O oh God, you have nourished us in this meal and fed our bodies and our souls. We have heard of your love. Send us out now to speak it. We have seen your love. Send us out now to show it. We have been fed on your love. Send us out now to share it. May all we do be done for your glory. Amen. Our final hymn is When Jesus the Healer Passed Through Galilee, and I would invite you to join in singing it now. Life is short, and there is not much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. from